You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get to this week's guest, a member of the Marine Corps for over 26 years, both active and reserves, currently still serving with the Marines in the reserves to hear his story. We'll do that in a moment. First, a word from our friends uh, over at our Amazon promotion at our website, hazardground.com. Go there. Click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or in the sponsors tab. You can do all of your normal Amazon shopping with the holidays coming up right around the corner. It's the easiest way for you to help out veterans charities because we get a percentage of whatever you guys spend. And then we'll donate a percentage of that back to some of the charities and organizations you've heard featured here on this show. So again, hazardground.com, the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the sponsors tab as well. Continue to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at hazardground.com hazard ground podcast need to continue to grow this hazard ground community and we can do that through some more apple reviews uh love getting the five-star reviews from you guys certainly appreciate it but it helps grow the show that apple algorithm continues to help promote us to newer and wider audiences so we can hear all these stories from uh, america's best and brightest here so again go to apple and uh, leave a five-star review tell us why you love the show and uh, we'll try to tag it up on social media as well Uh, now that that's out of the way let's get to this week's guest again Uh, Over 26 years in the Marine Corps between active duty and reserve time. He has three deployments, two to Iraq, one to Afghanistan, a couple of other spots around the world as well. Uh, He is currently still in the Marine Corps Reserves, and his title is uh, he's the Amphibious Operations Planner for the National Defense University Center and Applied Strategic Learning. Uh, So clearly there is a lot of experience there. Uh, Not only that, he works in the civilian side as a defense contractor. He is Mark Campbell joining us here on the hazard ground. Mark, uh, good afternoon. Welcome and thank you for joining me. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited to hear from your story again. You know, I've been finding the the connectivity um, between the military folks uh, is so there. And we've we've interviewed other guests on the show that you have you have known or, or familiar with or connected with one way or another. But, you know, your story particularly stood out given the jobs that you've had throughout your time in the Marine Corps, but um, it's been over 26 years. So uh, uh, all the way back to May of 1995 and Fordham University. Now, are you from New York? Cause that's, uh, I'm, I'm from Long Island. Yes. I'm from Boston originally. Okay, so, right. um, yeah. So like my parents are Irish immigrants. So I had kind of the quintessential Irish Catholic um, upbringing in Boston. You know, I don't wear a scally cap and, and all of that. You know, I'll, I'll listen to a little Dropkick Murphys, but it's not my, na- you know, my national anthem or anything. But right. yeah, then went uh, went to college at, uh, you know, at Fordham in New York City. So, you know, uh, good, good, a good Catholic uh, university. Can't, that's can't it. Hate. Good, good Catholic <laughs> school. So, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, so it was a good experience. I was, you know, I was there and I actually, you know, was interested in maybe going to law school or something. And then one day the, the Marine Corps, um, you know, officer recruiters were there on, on the campus and, you know, started talking to them and um, started going through, through the process with them. I mean, was there anything that you knew about the Marine Corps ahead of time or you just sort of, would, they, you thought they had something interesting to say? Yeah. So no, not, well, I mean, so not really in that, like, you know, I don't have any military, you know, family background. One of my uncles was in Vietnam in the Marine Corps, but he never really talked about it. I never really really got that growing up, but you know, I grew up in the eighties. So the Marine Corps is very active between Lebanon, Grenada, you know, things like that. And so you kind of saw a lot of that stuff. Once again, I didn't have a lot of exposure to other military, um, you know, uh, backgrounds. And so it just kind of, just kind of resonated, you know, grew up near the water in Boston. So definitely didn't want to be, you know, completely landlocked or anything like that. So it seemed like a good option. Now, did you end up doing like Navy ROTC or, I mean, how did you actually enter into the Marines? Yeah. So I did a, a program called platoon leader class. So what you do is you go to officer candidate school, um, the summer between your sophomore and junior year and the junior and senior year. So you actually break up OCS for, and for those who aren't familiar, it's kind of like the boot camp for officers. You split it up between two, um, two summer sessions, which is, you know, you don't get scholarship money. You do get a little bit about stipends for, for living and things like that. Um, but the thing that was interesting with that was um, that you, um, because you have to go back, 
we actually have a big attrition rate because, you know, you have people who will drop, you know, the DOR kind of like what they talk about with like buds and people who can actually quit um, in the middle of OCS, which happens, you know, a, a fair amount. But what actually happens a lot more is people just say between that first summer session and that second, they just say, I'm done, I'm not going back. And so it's a pretty heavy attrition rate. So that um, program had about a 50% attrition rate. Interesting. So you complete it and you get commissioned. Um, did you know what you wanted to do specifically in the Marine Corps? Or it was one of those things where they just kind of told you and you went with it. So that was another kind of interesting thing. I actually originally signed off as an aviation contract. So when I joined my officer selection office out of uh, Garden City, Long Island, um, they, they had you. There you go. Right. They had no ground slots available, it was, um, which was kind of funny. You know, I had 2020 20 vision and all of that. So I actually originally signed on as an aviation contract that had additional, you know, schooling and additional requirements for how long you were going to do. And it wasn't really something like some of the folks I ran into later had wanted to fly their whole life. That wasn't really something that had not, not that it you know, appealed to me, but it wasn't like a, a burning desire for me for, for m most of my uh, upbringing. So I knew that once I got in under that, I could drop to a ground slot uh, later on, which is what I did. So drop to, uh, to go ground. So then once you go to uh, Marine Corps basic officer training, what they call the basic school, you then compete for your specialty. And so um, you, they actually split it up in what they call a quality spread. So top third, middle third, bottom third, all, you know, if you're the top guy in the first third, you get your kind of your first choice, second, the top guy in the second third, you get your first choice, et cetera. And so I ended up choosing amphibious assault vehicles, um, which was a, a good fit for me. Um, you know, I've been around, you know, vehicles that my, my parents had like a fruit and produce wholesale business. I was driving out from the time I was, you know, had a license. You know, it's pretty familiar with with that type of stuff. It was in the ground combat arms space, which I like, but it also had some of that, you know, water aspect, mechanized, heavy machine guns, kind of, you know, everything you want uh, when you graduate college, you don't want to get a real job. <laughs> so that works out well for you then. Um, not fast forwarding too far, but where are you on 9-11? Yeah, so um, I actually out of so my initial contract was you know ended in the fall of 99 um and so i got out worked you know in a couple of uh, civilian jobs that type of thing um i was actually talking about maybe just coming back on for a little bit of you know active service just you know in the meantime i was actually planning to uh, go get my mba and so until i started that um and then 9 11 happened uh, um so i was in san diego working for a company that um, was actually one of the um, uh, companies that found jobs for military officers who got out. Um, I had I'd worked with them before and then worked as um, like trying to sign up companies to work with them and provide jobs. 9-11 uh, happened um, and I was actually kind of on a fast track to really, I was already talking to the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force about, you know, helping them out. And so got called up pretty much right away. Um, so served in, um, First Marine Expeditionary Force in what they um, in the group that actually trains the the Muse, the Marine Expeditionary Units, the guys who go on ship, um, who trains them to um, to get ready to deploy. And so I was part of an intelligence cell. Once again, it didn't have an intel background, but we were building scenarios. So you know, you build the scenarios for the training evolution, um, and uh, did that with them for about a year um, before I actually, you know, that uh, assignment ended and then went on to get my MBA or started my MBA, which has the whole other uh, wrinkle. Well, I mean, it's interesting. I I'm curious where your mindset was. I mean, look, part of the reason, I mean, I, I also got off active duty and part of the reason it was is because, you know, 24 seven, 365 isn't for everybody who puts on a uniform. I don't think that makes you lesser of a soldier or lesser of a Marine. I just think it means that you want to do different things and uh, yet still continue to serve. And so from that standpoint, yep. you're trying to carve out this space in the civilian world, yet you're getting pulled back um, into, uh, you know, a, a life of service that you signed up for. And so where, where is your headspace? Are you the, the uh, Marine that we talked to is like, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. Or is there a little bit of like, Hey man, I, I mean, I'll go if I'm called, but you know, like I, I've got this whole other world that I'm trying to build here uh, on the side. 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I'd say when I was on active duty, that was probably, you know, had had that occurred while I was on active duty, I probably wouldn't have ever gotten off, right? I mean, you know, right. some of the reason why I got off active duty was it was the late 90s. There wasn't that much going on. Nothing going on, and, exactly. Right. I wasn't and you were kind of all like, I could be at that point in time. I was very like, it, you know, you sold me this brochure and all I'm doing is right. sitting in in Texas wasting away. It's like, what are we doing here? That's right. I was an amphibious assault guy in 29 Palms, California, which is in the middle of the Mojave Desert. So, um, you know, n- not not very amphibious uh, out there. And so didn't really get to do those marine expeditionary units. I deployed to Okinawa, Japan, w- which was interesting. Um, but, you know, right. And so I was kind of like, well, th- there might be something else to do. Um, then. But, you know, 9-11 happened. Like we said, I went to college in New York City. I had um, Fitzgerald. So he was killed on 9-11. Yeah. Um, you know, another friend, her brother was a firefighter killed on 9-11. So, you know, had some connection with it, obviously, um, you know, and then came back on and said, you know, what can I, how can I do my part? So then um, after that ended, I went and I stayed in the reserve because, you know, I, I liked it. It kind of gave me that, you know, that fulfillment while I was um, doing uh, my, my MBA up at Pepperdine in Malibu. So, you know, still stayed in Southern California. And then, um, so then started that in, I guess, 2002. So right around as things were gearing up for Iraq. Um, so was, um, and, and here was the other one that was kind of interesting was I joined on with them. So it was a light armor reconnaissance unit. So another type of armored vehicle, once again, more mech infantry um, that I was pretty familiar with. And, um, you know, the, the kind of initial promise was, hey, you'll join as the adjutant, get our admin shop, you know, squared away, which we had some problems, then we'll move you over to a platoon. And then, you know, we, then we started deploying. So it was kind of like keep everyone in place and that type of stuff. So um, deployed with uh, Fourth Light Armor Reconnaissance Battalion uh, to Iraq in, uh, I guess that was, um, what, 2000, 2003? Yeah. So in the, um, yeah. So in the other spring of 2003 so the other thing was interesting was like you know leaving my mba program so um you know pepperdine you know up in malibu but it's a uh, church of christ school so it was very um very patriotic they're actually one of the they actually get awards as one of the most vet friendly schools to this day um so they were couldn't have been better about you know i mean i left with one week's notice um you know supported me as i came back things like that so um we we're supposed to actually go um, in some of the more uh, initial, let's say, invasion, um, uh, you know, timeline for, for Iraq. But um, it, it was funny. So when um, Turkey shut down, moving the 82nd through Turkey, they, the, uh, I'm sorry, not the 82nd, the 101st, they took all the aircraft. So then we got kind of pushed back in the, um, in the timeline to go. So, I mean, we, we ended up getting into Iraq in I think March of, uh, of 2003, which was kind of right as around um, some of the, um, you know, statues were getting pulled down. Yeah. Um, so we were part of a task force Harawa, which was kind of like uh, for the Marine Corps pulled a little bit to the right. So over to, um, to Al Qut and uh, those areas along the Iranian border. So, um, you know, and then we kind of almost, immediately kind of went into some of the stabilization operations and the other thing that was interesting was to see like everybody because we pulled out especially in the marine corps a lot of people really quick um you know we had the invasion you know pulled the statues down and then all of a sudden it was like okay let's get everybody home and uh you know we were you know a little bit later to get there maybe by you know a few weeks and um and then we we weren't going anywhere it was all of a sudden it was like you know well, this place isn't exactly stable and a lot of the combat forces have left. Um, and one was actually interesting was the company I later took over, uh, Charlie Company, 4th LAR, um, got pulled back to then deploy to Okinawa, Japan. Not exactly a hot military combat spot, but right. um, they were to fill in for an active duty. And so um, my um, headquarters unit got turned into a provisional rifle platoon. And so we were uh, patrolling a number of towns around um, along the border with Iran. Uh, and this is, you know, in the summer of, um, you know, 2003. Yeah. And so what was that experience like? I mean, you know, like, I mean, listen, you know, it's a hard pivot for guys like you and me who signed up in a pre 9-11 world and, you know, thinking that it was sort of maybe a means to an end way to pay for college, whatever it may be. 
Um, and then the world gets turned upside down. And now all of a sudden you're yeah. thrust into this combat environment that, you know, everyone's like, oh, that's never going to happen, you know? And of course it did. So where are you mentally with this whole experience and what's it like for you? I mean, I mean, do you feel like you're this hardened Marine who's ready for all this or is some of this just kind of brand new to you? I mean, for me, it was kind of, um, I mean, I think I was ready for it. You know, I was a little bit older. I was a, you know, mid-level captain. So it's not the same thing as like the 18 year old kid who was just, you know, doing algebra right. a couple of weeks before. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't, it, for me, I was actually the most frustrating part was actually not being in a combat role initially. I was being the adjutant and like having to do like administrative stuff as like watching people going out there on patrol. That was actually the hardest thing for me. And so when I, we did the provisional rifle platoon, although that was going to be a difficult mission, you know, getting together the cooks and bakers and candlestick makers to now be Marine Corps infantrymen doing patrols day and night. Um, but that kind of was like more the role I was comfortable with. Um, so yeah, we kind of assembled. And even for them, it was the same thing. The Marines, you know, who were like, you know, a lot of them were kind of the uh, chem biological guys and some of the administrators and some of the, um, you know, supply folks. That, like, you would think in certain cases, they would be a little bit like, you know, uh, concerned about doing that. They jumped right into it. They, they couldn't, you know, couldn't wait. Um, so, you know, yeah, but that was the thing I had about uh let's say about 25 guys to do day and night operations for three towns you know right along the iranian border which was actually right around when kutz force started moving in um now we didn't really fully appreciate that at the time right um but you know and but there was also still a bunch of reprisals so this was a little bit before the the insurgency had kicked off you know a little bit after the um you know saddam's military had kind of collapsed but there was a lot of people kind of settling grudges and, um, you know, we had to make sure that, you know, that was kept to as much of a minimum as we could, we could anticipate. Um, and then the only other kind of wrinkle in that was, um, so we had, uh, you know, me and my platoon charge, sergeant split up the, the platoon into, you know, day and night operations. He took day, I took night. And then he got what we were calling Saddam's revenge, which was dysentery. And so a, him, along with, you know, a number of other guys got, got dysentery. So he was hard down for about a week. So I was literally doing day and night operations for a week. Same. Yeah. I got dysentery in Iraq in 2011, which is, you know, they know all these fad diets. I'm like, hey, just get dysentery. You'll drop 30 pounds in about two weeks. <laughs> That's right. So now I know why yep. when I was playing Oregon Trail, people have died from dysentery. I'm like, what the hell is dysentery? <laughs> Anyway, uh, but yeah. I was also a mid-grade captain when I got to Iraq the first time in 05. And uh, I got to tell you, I wasn't all that thrilled to being shot at. Um, it was it was a new experience for me. Um, you know, I say that tongue in cheek, but, it, you know, again, it was just one of those things where it's like, you know, it, it mentally it's a hard pivot. Like you do the job that's in front of you. I don't think that's that's right. ever the issue that's in question. It's just, you know, the experience of, fit, you know, physically being shot at changes your mental capacity a little bit and sort of puts you in a different footing than what you had before when you were doing all those patrols and everything, did you guys see any actual combat or was some of it just like lighter stuff? It was, it was lighter. I mean, there was definitely, you know, uh, one of the towns, you know, we kind of um, had to interdict as the, some reprisal killings were going on in there. And, you know, uh, but some of it is, I, I tend to be very calm and methodical in some of those situations. So a lot, a lot of guys get all fired up and run in. I'm just like, okay, <laughs> let's just assess. And so started calling in. So we were, we were um, Humvee and foot mounted because we were the headquarters guys, but we had a light armor reconnaissance company or a platoon that was a nearby to support us. So, all right, let's go in, but let's call in the LAVs because, you know, armored armor and 25 millimeter chain gun makes a big impact. So, you know, let's call those guys in. We kind of methodically went up and, you know, it was, um, a lot of it had had kind of subsided by then, but you know we were actually working with um, what the, what we called the night guard, which were Iraqis, um, to kind of you know help sitch, you know uh, suss out the situation. But you know I kind of realized real quick is so what we can do in this case is make things a lot worse really quick instead of make them better. So like you know let's kind of treat the you know the force that we're going to to be. Um, uh, using let's be, be very specific around it uh you know not, let's not just go in guns blazing assume every gun that's being shot is being shot at us so stuff like that so um you know a lot of it was kind of yeah just dealing with it was like being a, a, a policeman in a bad neighborhood you're dealing with kind of local issues 
Now, when you leave Iraq in 2003, at the end of September 2003, in that late time yeah. frame, um, did you think at any point in time that you would be back, given sort of how quickly things had ended in the first four to six weeks, you know, three or four months of the war itself? So, no. And every time I've left, left Iraq, I've said never again. And that hasn't exactly always worked out so well. Yeah. Um, the, the other joke I kept making is I said, I'm only going to new wars. I'm not going to any old wars, which was also turned out to not be true. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think like now we it, it was funny at one point where I kind of got the preview and how things were going to go was. So the company commander of that provisional infantry company, he went to Baghdad one day. So we were once again in al Qud, kind of in the hinterlands. And um and he went to Baghdad and talked to like a big meeting about how things were going. And like when he was telling people that we kind of had a provisional police force formed and these night guards and we were paying them and we'd arm them and all of that, they were shocked that we made that much progress. They, they, and he was kind of like, it's like, wait a minute. I thought you were going to tell me how this was going. I thought you'd be ahead of me. And they were not. It was not like a, there wasn't a lot of, you know, a big plan that was going on. Once again, this was 2003, so early um so we got to see that which was once again the preview and then the other one was when we got consolidated down to um Babil province so south of baghdad so the, all the uh, light armor constants unit actually got augmented with a couple of um active duty infantry um companies we were uh, what were called uh task force scorpion and um we were you know same thing doing um local dismounted patrols as well as uh, armored vehicle patrols and things like that and we got to see kind of the the early insurgency as well so that area was later called the triangle of death so you yep. see Iskanderia, that that area and um yeah a friend of mine was literally he was one of the first ied uh on the way to to our position um so it was uh you know but you got to see that begin to to occur and this was once again in the you know, late summer of 2003. All right. So you end up back in Iraq in 2007. Yep. So four years after you leave, you're back there. Uh, right. In a goal this time, um, you know, you're executing 150 convoy security missions. Uh, is this convoy security the good kind or the bad kind? Like the bad kind, meaning you're just following around some flag officer uh, taking them from point A to point B kind of convoy security. Yeah, I guess by that standard, it was the good kind. So, um, so yeah, right. You know, come back to Iraq. I heard you missed me. I'm back. Yeah. Um, so it, this is actually an interesting time frame. So when I took over my, sorry, when I took over my light armor constants company, so it was Charlie company, fourth light armor constants out of uh, Riverton, Utah. So, um, you know, so I took them over in um, February of 06 literally my first weekend, you know, I told them it is not if we deploy, it's when. So let's just train as if that's going to happen and, and let's just get ready for it. Um, so we were assigned to um, a 1st Battalion, 10th Marines, an active duty uh, artillery uh, battalion who had a few different missions. So a couple were convoy security, a couple were prisoner handling. Um, I think there was a, another mission I don't really remember. And so the one thing was all the missions weren't decided. So, I mean, we're light armor constants company, combat security is one of the things that we do, but we're also reserve unit and they had active duty units. So we kind of had to make our case. It's like, look, you know, us not doing the convoy security mission is kind of a non-starter. Like this, this is really what we do for a living. You can, you know, we, you can say we're reservists, but a lot of us have as much combat experience. It's not more than your guys. So, um, so we were assigned to Camp Fallujah. So doing actually a lot of prisoner transfer, a lot of, um, you know, logistics convoy support. Um, but one of the one of the most interesting ones was we um, supported the movement of this thing called the MOAB, the, the MOAG, the mother of all generators. So it was a hundred ton um, generator that was going from the Syrian border into uh, Baghdad. And this thing could I think it could only move about maybe six miles an hour. And there was there was a whole and there was a whole kind of carnival of guys who are doing the support. So we had um, private security contractors as well as Iraqis, as well as us. And we kind of turned it from an outer cordon into a middle into the inner cordon. Um, you know, you couldn't go under the bridges, the overpasses. So you had to do even, you know, Iraqi highways and all that different from a U.S. highway. Do, do the, over, the off ramp back to the on ramp. 
because you couldn't go under it. But yeah, you had to move that thing slow. I, I mean, when I saw pictures, I used to, you know, I, I kind of joked, said you may as well just write a sign that say RPGs go here on yeah. it. Um, but, you know, it would like speed anything. not your friend, nor could it be. <laughs> no, right. It's, I mean, you know, speed, yeah, speed isn't your friend. And, you know, everyone knows where you are. Um, but it's kind of, you know, typical if you, if you put out a big enough show of force, most people don't want to get into a fight that they're not going to win, which was also kind of my mantra when we were doing convoy missions. It was always, I said, 10 to 14 gun trucks, which was the size of every platoon. And they, luckily we had mostly MRAPs by the time we were done. We started with Humvees, we ended with MRAPs, but it was, you know, all MRAPs with heavy machine guns or like medium machine guns. We got rid of the Mark 19s pretty quick because they didn't work that well in an urban environment. Uh, but it was like you had to put out a big enough show of force that anybody says, if I'm going to get into this fight, I'm absolutely going to lose. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, there's a reason why the bully doesn't pick on the bigger kid. Right. Right. The picks on the smaller kid. So uh, if, if you're the bigger kid or at least you look like the bigger kid, you kind of, you know, uh, you avoid a lot more fights than you than, than you want. And we used that same tactic when I was there in 05 to 06. It was always yep. guns out, shrills out, porcupine effect, make them scared. There's a softer target that's coming by later on. Unfortunately, right. not the same side of us, but, you know, they're doing it the wrong way. And, uh, you know, this is for your own survival. So I certainly that's understand. It. It. Yeah, that's it. They'll pick the four vehicle, the four Humvee, you know, convoy security mission that's going to come down. Forget to put you your know. guy in the turret down real low so it isn't, you know. Yeah. That's, that's right. That was always, always an exercise in futility to me. Um, you know, with, with the level of time you were out on the road and everything else, and, you know, this is right in the middle of the surge and IEDs are everywhere. I mean, what sort of contact did you guys see on a routine basis? Um, we, we definitely, and the thing was interesting. So I had three platoons out there regularly. I went, I was out with, with one of them all the time. And it was really interesting how it went. So I kind of let each of them run their convoys as long as, you know, the schedule dictated that they could pick when like dictate how they were going to go some guys went day some guys went night you know that type of thing and there was really not a huge amount of rhyme or reason to when they get contact other than one one time i'll specifically mention but yeah we got ied a few times we got actually um we were in our what like what's called right seat left seat so when you are doing your changeover with the unit that you're replacing at one point, you go out, you do a patrol, and you're in the right seat, meaning you're the passenger, you're watching. And then the next time you go out, you're in the left seat, you're driving, and they kind of give you the idea of what's going on. We were supporting the Iraqi Highway Patrol out there, and we, it was in a kind of a, an area that didn't have a lot of, um, you know, certainly activity, but it was also kind of out in the, in the hinterlands. It was, you know, some, a little town, but it wasn't, you know, we were between, you know, Fallujah and Ramadi, but it wasn't an urban area or anything like that. And so... Um, we were doing some movements and patrol, house to house, kind of talking to people. And then the vehicle in front of me, uh, there's a big flash and they, they get hit with, uh, with a dushka round. And, um, but the thing was, we're in the middle of right seat, left seat. So it gets a little bit dicey on who's in charge. Now, I'm kind of used to it, to being, it's like, if I'm there and unless the guy above me is at least one rank above, I am in charge. And so I just start kind of laying out commands. It's like, you know, contact right, you know, return fire and that type of thing. So, so we returned fire. And the one thing was, you know, the, the guys we were replacing, they did a great job, but by like, you know, the last couple of days, they were a bit burned out. And so they were like, you know, really want to, to, you know, haul it down the road to, to chase after them. And it was actually in an area that was where the Marine Corps area of responsibility ended and the Army area responsibility began. And so, I, once again, I, I kind of get calm when these situations occur. So I'm immediately like, okay, get off the road, because people started hauling ass down the road. I said, like, get off the road. If I was shooting at you, I would try to get you to chase me down the road and have IEDs waiting for you. So don't do that. So let's get off the road. We're going to chase, we're going to move after them over open terrain, because no one's put an IED there. You don't know where someone's going to go. And so started, you know, pursuing these guys um, in their dishka and their technical. And then we started getting very close to the army area of, of responsibility. And I said, okay, you know, the guys, the, 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 you know, insurgents may not shoot very well, but the Bradleys from the U S army shoot really well. And so what I do not want to do is get into a blue on blue with them. So, you know, as little as we wanted to kind of break off our pursuit, 
like called it and gave it to the uh, to the army guys said Here, here's what you need to be looking for and that type of thing because um you know uh, we, we definitely had some accurate and effective return of fire on that but you know certainly you know no no smoking vehicle or anything like that but it was just the wasn't wasn't worth trying to to start uh you know uh, mixing it up with, with the army when neither of us knows what's going on. Uh, that was kind of one example. Yeah, we had another guy. The, the MRAPs worked great. We had one of our um, Marines who literally had an IED go off under his seat on his 19th birthday. And um, he, he had his bell rung, but that was about it. So like, you know, one of them, so like they, each one kind of taught me about like lessons learned that I that it brought on to, to make sure the rest of the, the company knew was, so that one, you know, the first incident was about hot pursuit, right? When do you pursue? When do you not pursue? Is it okay? And let's, let's talk this out and make sure we have a clear picture. The other one was about positive identification. So in this incident, one guy was, um, they were doing a patrol along a, um, an aqueduct. And um, they, uh, once again, that IED went off. And then right as that IED went off, two Iraqis jumped onto a, um, a dirt bike and started moving away. And um, the one of my um, Marines who was dismounted at the time, he jumped up on a berm with his, you know, M4 and started returning fire. The vehicle that was next to him or whatever had a 50 cal. And, you know, he certainly would have made quick work of those guys and he didn't return fire. And so, you know, once we got him back and they were all safe, it's like, let's let's dissect this. Let's understand why. And so. Um, I started talking to him and this, uh, this guy's civilian job is a police officer. And so it, it basically what it broke down to was, you know, I asked him like, you know, what happened? Why didn't you return fire? He's like, well, I didn't see these guys do it. I'm like, do you think they did it? He's like, oh yeah. It's like, but you didn't return fire. He's like, well, I, I didn't see them. And, and it kind of had to break down into like, as a police officer, maybe their standard for, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt or something was a little bit higher. And it's like, look guys, if you can live with it, we'll be good. Like, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that not, that there isn't going to be any weird. Did you have positive identification? Did you not have, we get into that. And so that was another kind of lesson learned on what is PID and what is not PID. And it's not, you know, it, it's like, it, are you pretty sure? Good enough, you know? Um, so th that was uh, once again, kind of a, an interesting. So uh, I was very lucky in that deployment. So we had um, one guy who was wounded, in an IED a couple of weeks before we came back. Uh, once again, like some, um, some shrapnel in his, in his upper neck area. Um, he was, um, uh, he was the, the gunner, so he was a little bit more exposed, but the MRAPs did a great job. And by then too, the last thing was, there weren't as many IEDs and they weren't as big because the, uh, um, the Sunni awakening had happened. So there were so many vehicles that were on the road and we were actually getting uh, the IEDs turned in on us. We were told that here's where an IED is because the, the, the Sunni population in Anbar had basically come around to, we're not on these guys' side. So, you know, let's, let's work with the Americans. So, you know, the traffic had gone up. So if you, if you patrolled in the day or, or on, moved on a highway, there was a lot of other vehicles. So you weren't going to catch the IED. It was, you know, there were too many other vehicles. And then even at night, you, um, you know, you were well protected. And then a lot of the things were getting turned in. Yeah. I mean, we, we didn't have the luxury when I was there, as we were attached to uh, special forces and we didn't have the luxury of having those guys, you know, come with us or provide us convoy security. So, uh, cause they had other things going on. So we either left the very first thing in the morning, try to beat the terrorists to setting up the IDs yep. or, we waited until the hottest part of the day in the afternoon because in the hopes that all the ideas are already blown up. And uh, surprisingly, folks, terrorists are still lazy. Um, they don't want to work in the middle of 130 degree heat either. So um, even though we didn't want to do it then, it was safer for us to be out there uh, in the heat and, and brave that as opposed to, you know, uh, anything from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. lunchtime local uh, was 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 a bad time because there were a lot of things that exploded in, in that window. So, yeah. And especially if they were command detonated, right. You probably yes. had the electronic countermeasures even, even then. And so, you know, you could jam up, you know, a, a car oh, door. The remote. never worked. They, 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 all they did was True. block my own communications. Like it's like, True, Hey, if you get outside the wire, turn on your jammer. It's like, why now I can't talk to anybody. Now yeah, I just got to use the alarm signals the whole way and wave at people. 
Um, or if you wanted to down someone's civilian drone that they brought to uh, to the combat zone, you turn the jammer on, that thing dropped like a stone. Really? That worked for you? Yeah. I, I, no, I, if anybody tried a drone on me, I, I never knew. Um, I might have been clueless to it, but... I, I mean, it worked in, you know, in 07, I'm sure that they probably deconflicted the frequencies. But yeah, that happens actually on um, Camp Liberty on uh, Baghdad Airport. So yeah, I'm not like, but the enemy wasn't using that type of drones, you know, at that at that time. Yeah, I mean, again, I, uh, uh, if, if my jammer ever actually did block an IED from going off, obviously I didn't know about it because it didn't. The right. ones that went off, I, it did. And I don't even remember. Yeah, you know. I don't, I, 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 probably not. I do. Two of the times I got hit, I wasn't even in an American Humvee. I was in an Iraqi Humvee, so I know they didn't have a jammer. So there's that. Yeah. Um, you know, hey, here, here's your gift. Thanks for rolling over a bomb. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, anyway, so uh, you finished that second deployment. You know, is there any thought at this point in time uh, from you about, like, you know, changing the course of your career? Are you, like, fully entrenched? Hey, I'm just hanging out in the reserves here, or do you want to look at a different path possibly? So, so that's, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. So around then was probably – I might have made an assumption that the Marine Corps wasn't going to take me back on active duty orders rather than just actually ask the question. I probably at that point, it probably should have gone back on because especially as we talk about the later half, most of that was actually on active orders, even just working in a headquarters or something. And so the thing was that the Marine Corps, especially at the time, maybe a little bit later, and then, you know, a, a kind of a quick blip was bringing people back on active duty orders. But after a certain point, they, they tend to not want to invest in the more expensive people, so majors and above, and want to invest in the cheaper guys, so, you know, young officers, young enlisted guys. And so, um, you know, it, it, there probably was a window by which I, I probably could have con gone back on active orders. I would say it was brief, but, but I don't, you know, like active duty full time, but I, I don't know for sure. But I mean, uh, certainly I did end up almost going that direction anyway right. and we can talk about that well i mean you end up in bahrain crying yeah. out loud which is like a deployment but it's not a deployment like you're sort of in the aor uh but not necessarily in a combat zone i mean what, what happens there yeah so i mean so afterwards i came back so i was a three years as a company commander to employ to, to include a combat deployment which is quite a lot um, went back, did like a school, which is your required command and staff college, you know, but um, went back to my uh, civilian job at the time was at and I was in their leadership development program, and then got uh, selected for promotion to lieutenant colonel. So, you know, at this point, you know, I'm kind of thinking my Marine Corps career is going a little bit better than, than my at and career. It wasn't that that was bad. It's just, you know, like literally you know, setting up people's cable in, you know, San Francisco is, you know, it isn't quite the same thing and taking calls in like the middle of the night. You know, it's not quite the same as, you know, military duty. Right. So uh, at that time, so actually, so Bahrain was attached to Marcent. So, um, so the Marine Corps component to central command. So CENTCOM, the guys who are in charge of the Middle East, each have a component that represents each of the services so from, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Marine Corps Special Operations. So I was part of MARCENT, which is the Marine Corps component to Central Command, which is in Tampa, Florida, which is up there ever since. So uh, like, like uh, you know, I was before that as in Northern California working for at and it, it was okay, it was, but, you know, I, I was interested in maybe, you know, doing something else. So I um, got orders to, to MARCENT as the force deployment planner. So I was in charge of all movement of equipment and personnel in and out of the Middle East from 2010 to 2013. So, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, you, you want job security, have a job no one wants to do. Um, so, you know, a lot of responsibility, a lot going on. Um, and so that was it was interesting. I mean, I, I liked it, especially once I got pretty good at it. You know, the kind of the, and this was kind of right around the Afghan surge. So, you know, the, the number, well, I'll just, I had to manage a number. I don't want to get specifics just in case it's, you know, sensitive, but I had to manage a specific number of Marines and it was down to a one. It was down to like, you know, a couple thousand, you know, like, let's just say uh, anyway. And so I had to manage to a specific number that there could not be more than that number of Marines in Afghanistan at any given time. So, you know, um, did that um you know we moved uh, the first deployment of tanks um in the u.s military into afghanistan 
um, which was, was interesting. Once again, very secret, very classified until, you know, a Congress had to approve it. And then it was in the news the next day. <clears throat> and then the, the other one that was, that was kind of a notable was the, so I was in Bahrain on an exercise. I'd go out there periodically because Mar said head, forward headquarters in the Middle East is in Bahrain. And this was at, so in, um, 9-11 of 2012, right? Everybody focuses on Benghazi and all that, which was obviously yeah. tragic, something we should talk about. Um, but like the other thing that occurred right around that same time was as we were drawing down in Afghanistan, you know, and this was 2012, so it was early. We didn't certainly get out for a decade, but um, we were drawing down forces and then a bunch of Taliban got onto the U.S. military base in um, Bastion, it was called. They actually... Um, assaulted the um the harriers so the um you know the fixed wing squadron killed the um the squadron commander as he heroically um you know tried to defend his folks and blew up i think it was six aircraft so it was the it was the most u.s aircraft that have ever been destroyed at one time since vietnam and so we actually had to then do quite a bit of work to get a replacement squadron out there and i think we had them out there in 96 hours so once again, you know, I certainly didn't fly one of them, but there was a lot of coordination and behind the scenes and, you know, um, a different um, uh, like overflight of, of different countries and, you know, that, that type of thing. All right. So you have this job um, yep. and you're sort of first back into this thing, yet it's still another couple of years before Afghanistan comes calling. Yeah. So, um, so then I, it was funny. So then I was, you know, once again, I was doing pretty well. So uh, while I was inactive, with um with Marsant, I got um, picked for command, so for battalion command. So get to go back to amphibious assault vehicles, which I hadn't done since like you know late '99. Um, but you know, I've been in mech the whole time. At a certain point, you know, some amount of sorry, my dog's barking. Some amount of mech is is you know you you used to the the situation, and so I get picked to be the battalion commander, which once again, luckily, was in Tampa as well. So I had to give up a full-time active duty job to take a part-time reserve job. Um, so they kept me on as a planner. So I actually stayed as a contractor. I planned, um, you know, a number of the things. Um, let's see, I was the planner for Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria. I did some of the counter ISIS, but all as a civilian, um, all of that. But then at the same time, I was a battalion commander um, in uh, amphibious assault. The big thing that was interesting then was we actually grew the company by two platoons. So when it was before that, it was two, um, I'm sorry, not by, by two full companies. We grew the battalion by two companies. So before that, it was um, two line amphibious assault companies and a headquarters company. We got two additional amphibious assault companies because they were moving from the active duty to the reserve as they were kind of reorganizing the active duty forces. So I had to grow the unit by about 50%. Um, which was generally a good problem to have as a lot of organizations in the Marine Corps at that time were downsizing, but it's still a problem. Um, so it was, you know, it, it was, that was very interesting, kind of challenging. Also building the staff back up, the previous commander who, who was great, became a, became a general, but he was very focused on the companies. I knew as a, as a reserve company commander that was hundreds of miles from my boss, those guys kind of have it on their own. They, they have the staff, they have the infrastructure to be self-supportive. Not that I wouldn't support them as much as they needed, but the staff kind of needed that love and attention that I kind of knew working for a three-star during my regular job. Um, the one thing that's interesting, going from being a staff officer during the week to a commander on the weekend is you find out on Monday, your jokes aren't as funny as they were on the weekend. Um, and the other thing that you also get to see is the staff jujitsu that you're trying to do to the three star, your staff tries to do to you, which I kind of was, unfortunately for them, was able to see through pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, all the duality of the whole thing. It's a it's it's a yeah. strange life we lead. You know, that said, um, obviously, your experience uh, as a deployed as a commander and a battalion level commander is much different than one as a PL on the ground uh, or even, you know, a, a company commander. So. Uh, what was the kind of biggest, uh, you know, takeaways from your deployment as a, as a battalion level commander? Um, and once again, I didn't deploy, I just, you know, but I was, as, yeah, I was in command there, not, not as the battalion. Um, the, uh, the big thing was kind of, it's a lot more mentoring and kind of guiding, right? Because you're in charge of now, especially in the reserve, you know, captains and majors and, you know, senior enlisted folks. And so 
you know, it isn't down to the level of, you know, platoon commander where that guy who's next to you may not have been in the Marine Corps for two years. Now you're leading guys who've been in the Marine Corps for decades. And so it's kind of more on the line of guidance and, and what, you know, what, but also there's more vision. Like you're, you're trying to determine what this unit needs to look like when you leave in two years, because that's happening either way. And, you know, the, the other thing was interesting was like, I realized, don't try to do too much because you can only get one or two things done in that two years. And so if you focus on those things like a laser beam, you're going to get them done. If you focus on too many other things, you're going to get 60% of all of them done, but none of them completed. Um, after you get back from Afghanistan, you, like you're now yeah. at, the, at the tail end of your career here, but yeah, yeah. Uh, you keep on going. So like, where is the drive? Where's the pull to keep on going? Are you at the point where you're just saying, they'll tell me when they're done with me and I could just keep doing this or uh, now, is there something more you want to accomplish? Well, the Marine Corps keeps making the same mistake, which is promoting me. Um, yeah, so, that, so that was part of it. So I got promoted um, right when I either when I was in Afghanistan, I was there in a staff role, so nothing particularly sexy there. Um, and but, um, you know, or right when I got back, I forget which. And so the, the nice thing about the reserves is there's no kind of, you know, um, planning for your career. You just get fired from one job to the next. So you have to find something new every time. So I had to actually find a, a kernel level job, which there weren't a, a huge amount. So I ended up once again, you want job security, do something hard that no one wants to do. So I ended up being the uh, current operations officer for 3MF. So that's the Marine Expeditionary Force that's in charge of all um, Marines in Asia. And so the, um, I was, the, you know, once again, the, the reserve version of the current operations officer who's in charge of all current operations. So I would come out for exercises and then I would run pretty much the entire combat operations center for the exercise, main, sometimes on the night shift more often, so the active duty guy could take the day shift, but still it's kind of a, a pretty pretty busy, pretty senior job. Um, that was good, um, you know, got some good experience other than like a lot of long plane rides back and forth to Japan. But, um, you know, but then same thing, that ended after three years and then one of those years was COVID. Um, so it was kind of, it wasn't, you know, so it was remote work, which the Marine Corps kind of had, to, everyone had to adapt to. Um, but then, um, you know, I, I wasn't completely ready yet to, to be done. As you said, I'm just, you know, the next thing and we'll see. So, so my current job is, as I, I'm at National Defense University and, you know, it, it basically what I do is war games. So I build and plan and execute war games. So the, the, a couple of the things that I've done, I think are actually pretty interesting is I'm, in, I've uh, run a planning session for. Iraqi general officers in what's called their capstone course. So capstone course is what we put general officers through when they're newly promoted or when they kind of need a refresher or something. And so the Iraqis um, come here. So it's a smattering of colonels, one-star generals and two-star generals. And so we take them through a planning session. Um, I do that for about a week, um, which, which is pretty good. Obviously I'm familiar with the Iraqis and I'm actually familiar with the problem set that we did as a planner. Um, I was like on the U.S. planning team for this problem set in Iraq. Um, and then the other thing that's, that's really cool that we do is so when what we call the international fellows, so the foreign students who are about to join NDU, they come in early to get their badges and clearances and accounts, and we take them through American studies. And actually, I took a number of foreign officers from everywhere in the world, from, you know, Kenya to the U.K. to, you know, Middle East, wherever, and they um, actually do what's called a constitutional convention. So they role play as founding fathers drafting up a constitution. So it was pretty cool. Our George Washington was a Muslim female and, you know, like Alexander Hamilton is like a Kenyan officer and they, they have to literally, but they have to know who their character is and then argue from the standpoint of someone from Virginia who's a anti-federalist and all of that. So it's pretty cool. Wow. Uh, so we're talking about you know, almost nearly 30 years. Um, yeah. How do you know when it'll, when it'll be over? Um, well, I think it'll be over at about 30. I actually just looked in my, um, I think at 25 is a kind of a mandatory uh, end date. It's I think in like the summer of 25. In the meantime, the, the, as you can tell, I like the job at National Defense University. I have two more years there. Um, so I'll certainly do that. If I find another job, it's kind of like, you know, at this point in your career, the cliche is you do it until it's not fun. 
Um, and so if the next job is, um, you know, isn't particularly interesting or fun, I'll end it there. If not, maybe I got one, one more in me, but you know, I like it. It keeps my clearance, you know, um, you're certainly involved in interesting things. Um, you know, luckily I don't have to uh, be in a, in a tent in the dirt much anymore at this portion of my career. Not that I'd be against it, but you know, only if I'm shooting 25 millimeter chain gun and getting to do fun things. Exactly. Well, look, I mean, it, it's, uh, I'm glad you're still hanging around. It gives me validation that I'm still doing it for the right reasons. <laughs> That's right. At this point in time, like I keep telling everybody I'm on the 18th tee of, uh, of a long career here, just uh, trying to finish up and, uh, you know, hopefully I play a little scratch golf on the way out the door, so to speak, but you know, yeah, okay. I mean, I've, I've made the decision that I'm not going to go for, you know, general officer. I mean, I would have had to have done the things that would get me there, you know, a couple of years ago and made that decision. So at a certain point, you've kind of made the decision. It's just then letting the rest of the, of the scene play out. Right. Right. Uh, biggest takeaway from your career. I mean, the big thing is just leadership. I mean, like, you know, I've learned a lot about it. I've been around great leaders, you know, I've been around ones that, that, you know, were lacking. Um, and it just has become part of my life. It's, you know, I was in actually a leadership course with my, with my current, uh, with my civilian company. And, you know, I literally had more leadership experience than everybody else in the room combined by, by a factor. Um, but, you know, it's, that's, it's just that you never stop learning, but you never stop kind of thinking about that stuff. And it's just, it's, it's like every other skill. You have to think about it. You got to work on it. Um, but, you know, you learn a lot about human nature when you do that. Yeah. And, you know, again, I, I, I call it the American Idol principle, you know, because it's the whole concept of, you know, the minute somebody on that show starts opening their mouth, you know, immediately if they can sing. Right. Well, it's a little bit opposite sometimes with leadership. Like you might not always know when somebody is a good leader. It might take a little time to figure out, but you immediately know when they're a bad leader. Like that is easy to spot right off the right off the jump. Uh, from the yeah. first few minutes of interacting with him, you could tell, you know, this, this is not what I expect leaders to be. Uh, and, and the same thing, I, I would have given the same answer, you know, after 20 plus years that it's like, yeah, I, I am, a, I am a subject matter expert in the field of leadership. Um, yeah. I've done it at the highest levels in the most challenging assignments and in the most difficult conditions. And, and that is something that, you know, I, I think you take with you everywhere. So uh, continued success to you. Look, I know, I know you got to run. I wish you had more time. Yeah, I got to go. I appreciate certainly uh, everything that you've uh, you've offered us up here today. Again, continued success in the Marine Corps in your civilian career. We certainly appreciate it, man. Thanks for sharing with us, and uh, it's great that you got a chance to tell your story with us. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. All right, Mark Campbell. Thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.